imagine you are fighting an invisible enemy, an enemy much bigger and much more powerful than you. Imagine you can't predict your enemy's next move, what the next blow would be like, at what speed it would come, when it would come, what damage it would do, what would you do? Fight it out till the last breath, battle it with all your might, or would you willingly throw down your weapons and invite certain men? Sounds ridiculous. But today, we are not fighting a battle. We are at war. And this time, our enemy is not only invisible, it is everywhere. A pandemic is upon us, engulfing the entire world second by second. We have been at wars with pandemics earlier too and survived the wrath of plague, cholera, HIV. Each of them have been catastrophic, leaving death and destruction in their wake. And this time around, we don't even know who our enemy is. We've named it COVID-19 and we know very little about it. All we know is that we have no prevention to safeguard us and no easy cure within our reach. This pandemic of COVID-19 has simultaneously induced with it an epidemic of anxiety. Let's hear it from the psychiatrist about the bigger and untalked parts of the situation. Since we are in the middle of a global pandemic, it's a stressful time for all of us. And I've seen a lot of new cases of anxiety popping up. And a lot of them have health anxiety where, or hypochondriasis as we call it, where they're convinced that they have the virus or they might have gotten the virus and they need to be tested immediately. And reassurance does not work for them. They need proper medication and counselling. I've also seen an increase in the anxiety levels as well as the depression of a lot of my previous patients because these are uncertain times and they are finding it difficult to cope with this. Sleep seems to be another big issue for a lot of people. We are working from home now and our daily routines and structures are disturbed. Our sleep cycle is also disturbed. Most of the inpatient admissions are for people who are withdrawing from alcohol or other substances. Because of the lockdown, people who are dependent or addicted to a certain substance or alcohol are suddenly not able to find it, so they are experiencing severe withdrawal symptoms. When it comes to alcohol and some other drugs, withdrawal can be very severe and you can present with seizures or uh, delirium and so these people are getting admitted into the hospitals. And the challenge of being a psychiatrist is that you are expected to remain calm and stable and not worry. And at the end of the day, I think we all just have to keep calm and carry on. Some evidence suggests that children are less vulnerable to this deadly virus. Nevertheless, there have been certain studies which have showed the young being affected. And this, along with the implementation of school closures a few weeks back, has worried many parents about the effect of this virus on their little ones. Let's hear it from the expert. As a private practitioner, I come across a lot of influenza-like illness, especially in the post-exam holiday season. But thanks to the lockdown, no parties, no ice creams, no soft drinks, these illnesses have come down dramatically. While we see quite a number of uh, respiratory illnesses, the government guidelines and the restrictive algorithm for testing has not allowed us to do as many tests as we would like to do in the patients with respiratory illnesses. But then, that's the reality of uh, public health. Regarding vaccination, the guidelines are to postpone the vaccines except for those which are a must do and cannot be postponed, like uh, the rabies vaccine and probably the third dose of rotavirus vaccine. Many of my patients are worried whether their children are suffering from COVID-19, but they have the symptoms of COVID-19. Most of them can be reassured on phone and some of them can be reassured by asking them to go on to the self-check on the Arugya Setu app, which has been quite reassuring. Another vulnerable group stand our loved ones who are battling cancers. As if they didn't have enough in their hands to deal with, now comes an added enemy, the COVID-19. Over to the oncologist to guide us on how to combat this. 
As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has completely changed the way we look at things in every sphere of our lives. Uh, as a practicing oncologist, when I see a patient, this is how I would like to classify in the present situation. Patients who present with curable malignancies, patients who present with locally advanced malignancy, uh, malignancies but with a very good chance of survival, patients who present with stage 4 diseases where no great therapies are available and where chances of survival are kind of bleak for and patients who are on supportive care for pain management and stage patients. So the patients who present with curable malignancies have to be treated at any cost. They should not, the treatment should not be postponed, the diagnosis and all the management of the cancer should be done properly after taking appropriate precautions for the COVID-19 pandemic. Patients with locally advanced malignancies, if they are young without any comorbidities, try to explain them and start an appropriate chemotherapy agent. If they are old and if there are appropriate oral therapies available to tide over the crisis for the present being, present time being, then start them on oral therapies. The third set of patients where people who present with stage 4 malignancies with no appropriate therapy available or who are unfit for any kind of chemotherapy should be managed supportively by supportive care. They should not be started on therapies which are of less benefit and more side effects. For supportive care for end-of-life care patients has to be con continued as usual. Maybe make the hospital visits a little less, try to supply them morphine or painkillers back home or get one patient attendant to come to the hospital to take the care of the analgesic supplies and probably video call them for uh, as and when required for appropriate consultation. The visits should be as minimal as possible to the hospital. Our only line of defense against this enemy, our first and final frontiers against this long and devastating battle against the COVID-19 are our doctors. Our healthcare workers who are putting their lives and their safety on the line to keep the damage from snowballing out of our control. They are our unarmed soldiers who are fighting it out alone with no weapons, no tools, no defenses, not even the basic personal protective equipment which they require to ensure their own safety. And this sort of situation which has arised is not only a burden to the country but also a very huge burden on the society as well as to the doctors who are exposed to this situation. We are more concerned and worried about the younger individuals who have been sent to the field without proper gears and we are losing quite a number of the field force who is directly in contact with the patients. Hence from IMA we would want to strongly send a message to the government as well as public that our workforce has to be safeguarded. But strangely even as the death tolls are increasing exponentially, we are ridiculously gambling away our only chance of survival by burdening, isolating, stigmatizing and even attacking the doctors and healthcare workers. Slaps, harassments, abrupt notices to vacate. There seems to be no end in sight for these doctors who are already struggling to deal with the unprecedented number of cases and patients. First regarding the common problems we face as healthcare providers in treating COVID-19 patients. Most of the patients just fine with milder symptoms or no symptoms. When these patients are advised to go for isolation, they don't like the idea of longer hospital stay. This disturbs their mood because of which doctors has to face hostility and non-cooperation. They have to understand that this isolation is for their safety and also for the safety of the society. Some of the patients are going to be very sick because of age or associated comorbid conditions. 
in spite of best of medical efforts, these patients may not survive. In these situations, doctor has to face violence and accused of not doing enough. If they understand how much of stress and risk doctors has to undergo while treating patients on dialysis and ventilator, these unfortunate situations will not arise. You definitely can't join the doctors on the front line. The best thing for you to do would be to stay home and follow the government directives. But there certainly are other things which you could do to help us.